everyone. It's good to see that uh, on our second day, our numbers are even increasing to higher heights. So it is just good to see such interest in this, this topic. So just to get started, uh, I'll introduce very simply Professor Joseph Ho uh, from Albion College, who will be speaking about uh, photography and relating it to the topic of this symposium. Professor Ho. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. And um, thank you, Dr. O'Keefe, uh, in advance for your comments. Thank you to all of you uh, for being here today and for uh, really, this, these are tough acts to follow in terms of the talks and the comments and the questions that have come up. And uh, I hope to add a little bit more today based on my research in transnational visual practices, photography, filmmaking, and uh, Chinese Christianity in various manners. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we will be on our way. All right, let me know if you guys can see that. Just a quick thumbs up to see if it's clear. Perfect, all right. So I want us to start with this idea of visualizing. How does, make, what, how does one make something visual? And this process of creating and transforming um, something, uh, some kind of reality, some kind of environment into a visual object uh, and a kind of visual imagination. So I, my talk title today is a kind of play on words because the classical uh, description for a camera is a camera obscura, a dark chamber. But in this case, when we think about Chinese Christian architecture and um, architecture in general, we are thinking about illuminated chambers, camera illuminata, and the ways in which these chambers um, and these spaces are translated into visual terms. So I'd like to start off with, and Dr. Kumans yesterday brought up this excellent image that I wish we could also talk a little bit more about. And Dr. Ireland uh, may be pleased to see that this is from the, the uh, Chinese posters, Chinese Christian posters collection at, um, at Boston University. And thinking about this as a kind of analogy for translation, of course, this is a catechism poster uh, attempting to answer the question, who is the head of the Catholic church? But as you zoom in a little closer, you'll notice that these are forms of architecture that have also been translated into this poster. And then from there, the kind of message that Christ is the invisible head, the Kambujian, the uh, head of the Christian church around the world. And you could read all sorts of things into this image. Um, of course, the kind of East and West and going back to this classic missionary hymn from the Protestant tradition, in Christ there is, no east or west, in him no south nor north. Um, in this case, we've got the west uh, on the right-hand side of the poster and the east on the left-hand side of the poster. Um, and interestingly enough, this particular building is also translated. It's not a pagoda. It's not a neo-Gothic or Gothic um, form. It may be one of Gresnik's type of you know, hybrid forms of Sino-Christian architecture. But I leave that there as a kind of starting point, not because we're gonna talk about the poster, but really the topic of today's talk is visual translation. And for the students out there, a couple of uh, key points for us to kind of uh, write down, jot down as we think about the topics for today, these tensions and the kinds of elements or characteristics that we may want to think about when we consider visual translation or today's topic, photographic translation. The tension between vision and visibility, uh, how we see and how we literally confront something with our eyes, and imagination, the levels of um, you know, imagination or belief or interpretation that we add on to what we see, which is generally, again, imagination being invisible. Also, the tensions between image and text. When we have a visible object or a, an image, how do we um, superimpose or add to or frame this image with text, whether that is imaginary text or written text. Furthermore, issues with space, place, and framing, how we define a space, how we create place, and how we frame those things in images. Uh, of course, the kinds of other characteristics that we don't often think about when we think about photography. Often when we think about photography or filmmaking, we're looking at the finished products of processes. We look at the images. However, 
the act of photography, the act of filmmaking, how is that performance? And how is that also capturing kinds of performativity or performance or movement or representation that is frozen in time and yet is existing in some kind of visible reality ahead of the lens and behind the lens. And finally, the issues of seeing and believing, the tensions between what we see and what we believe and how we belong and how viewers and subjects and makers of these images belong and how these images are a kind of thread through which these kinds of characteristics may run. And to kind of map that onto Gresnik, um, in terms of when I read through Chinese architecture, I noticed that there are moments in which Gresnik is trying to capture some of those characteristics of visual translation in his words. These gateways are wide open portals through which one enjoys a surprising view of perspective. So he's almost placing us in the position of a viewer who is walking through these gateways, inhabiting these buildings, um, these kinds of, uh, of verbs as one advances through the courtyards, as one emerges from the last gateway. This ponderous edifice, the temple proper, looms up before his gaze. This idea that architecture is not simply meant to be representative, it's meant to be seen and experienced and walked through and touched and imagined. And finally, the issues of light, um, the closer to my own field, how, are, how is light an element in the way that architecture is formed? And Gresnik has moments where he talks about light and, and this, this kind of phrase, really good, this um, playing in light and shadow and all sorts of capricious silhouettes in describing Chinese architecture and its relationship to light. Chinese architecture as camera illuminata, chambers that are illuminated with light. And I'd like to pause for a moment and have you all engage in a kind of thought exercise. And you may write this down in your notes, uh, again, for the students out there or anyone who is, who is uh, participating today, a quick thought exercise. How would you make an image or take a photograph of a building? And you can write down a couple of ways you might do that. How, do, how would you take a photograph or even make a film of a building? And now how would you make a photograph of a religious building? What would you focus on? What would you be interested in? What would you do to kind of represent a religious building in a photograph or a film that you are producing? And uh, we may not actually have time to talk about them, but we can save these uh, kinds of comments for after. Um, and the last question or the corollary from these questions, how would you make a photograph or a film of a religious community as opposed to a building? Because something I want to expand upon today in my presentation is to, to have architecture be one of the anchoring points, but also move away from architecture in thinking about Chinese Christian sacred space as anchored by buildings, but also beyond buildings. It's a religious community. And how does one in the, the lens, in this camera, produce images of a religious community? And one other thing to kind of add before I move on to the rest of this presentation is for us to perhaps break apart or push hard against this idea that missionary images are only missionary imaginations. That when we look at photographs made of religious communities, of churches, of architecture, that this is not simply a missionary's total control over his or her environment. In this way, we have to see the Chinese subjects or the people within the images or around the images looking back at us, that they push back. They ask questions of us as viewers and the missionaries are not in full control of the kinds of identities and images that they themselves are producing, but rather it's a dialogue, it's a conversation. Certainly there's a power dynamic involved, but let's push hard against the idea that images are only one directional, that they only go from maker to sender or maker to audience, or that they only capture one type of perspective. In fact, there are many perspectives here. So let's all keep that in mind. And because I love technology, 
and because I love photographic technology, I want us to think about the ways in which that kind of experience of making an image of Chinese Christian architecture or community would have looked like from the perspective of a photographer in that time period. And this is a photograph from 1917 of a Protestant missionary educator setting up his camera to take a picture of something that's outside the frame. We don't know what it is. Is it a building? Is it an uh, environment? We don't know. But to kind of get us into the shoes of what it would have looked like to actually be there working with that apparatus. And clearly, the kind of scene that this photographer would have seen through his viewfinder would not have been what we see in this picture. This is probably closer to an approximation of what that photographer would have seen in the darkness under that cloth with the heat and the humidity surrounding his, I mean, the breath inside that cloth, looking at the screen in the back of his camera. The photographer would have seen the entire landscape upside down and flipped left to right in the darkness. And imagine how that person, whether male or female, whether Chinese or American or foreign, would have had to go through mental steps to think about how this image would have appeared in the final form. Make sure the camera's not tilted. Are we getting the verticals right? Are we getting everything in the frame? Are there people moving in the frame? What's the exposure? What's the sunlight? When can I trip the shutter? All of these kinds of technologically inflected performance aspects are involved in that particular moment. And furthermore, if he wasn't using that camera, perhaps he's using this kind of camera. And after yesterday's talk, um, at, uh, Dr. Wong's talk, I actually drove out to St. Thomas the Apostle Church on the other side of Ann Arbor with this camera to take a picture of that church through the viewfinder to give you a sense of what it might have looked like to actually photograph a church. And um, in this case, uh, this particular camera does have connections to China, which I will not go into in particular detail, but perhaps this is the type of image that a photographer using this kind of camera would have seen. Smaller, also dark, flipped left to right, but not you know vertically to the bottom. And I also have that camera here, which I will then try to set up to take your picture in a way. And, and if you've seen my talks before, I tend to do this because I like doing it. Um, but this kind of idea of what the apparatus looks like and what you might see through it. And if you were using yet another kind of camera, which was very prevalent during this time period, a simple folding viewfinder camera, um, this is what you would have seen through the viewfinder, which again, I will try to approximate as I take your picture right now. But these are the kinds of devices that would have stood between the photographer and the images that we see. So when you consider that question of how you would make that image of a religious community or a building, think about these steps, think about what's involved. And the moment of seeing that we see is not the same moment that the photographer would have seen in his or her direct view through that apparatus. But to kind of push back against this or, or think about the ways in which architecture and visual imagination fit into this history, I also want to have us consider moments in which the landscape is perhaps more of a weight or more of a focal point than the church or the building itself. In this case, we have from the Passionist Collection, uh, and again, I, I highly recommend that any of you speak to Father Rob Carboneau uh, in terms of the materials that I'm talking about today. But in this case, we've had this mission, a Catholic mission, a Passionist mission, um, in 19, about 1925 in the mountains of Hunan. And in this case, it's a mission, but the kind of Christian symbol that that identifies this mission is so small, you have to scan the image to find it. It's almost like, where's Waldo? The photographer has to literally in the text say, white cross on roof, look for that. Um, because the mission itself is embedded in the landscape. And it's not even this kind of architectural standout. It's not the Catholic cathedral rising up over Xu Jiahui or Guangzhou or Beijing. It's a converted building that has a white cross painted on the top, a Chinese building, to indicate that it is a mission. So in this case, it's almost like the, the landscape supersedes the kind of architecture and yet the viewers of this image and the makers of this image must consider this is a Catholic community. It's a Catholic community not 
created in architectural form, but is referenced with a single symbol and on a Chinese building superseded by the mountains around it. And Dr. Stephanie Wong yesterday talked about this quote from Constant, Con Constantini of this, uh, you know, the electricity, right? Wires, culture, and this modern type of analogy that is used by the missionaries. And this modernity is also embedded in the images and the text here. In this case, the, the photographer, Father Raphael Vance, goes out of his way to say, look at that, there are telegraph connections. You can barely make out the wires on these mountain hills going up over connecting us to the outside world. And these Im missionary image makers and these Chinese Catholic participants are living in a world in which technology um, is starting to inform the ways that they imagine their connection to other places. Technology is informing the ways in which they produce representations of their communities and technology itself is graven onto the images themselves that we are looking at today. But now let's take us into further. So we're actually walking into the church in which that white cross is marked. And uh, we have from the writings that that church was once a theater. It was a Chinese building used as a theater converted into a Catholic church. And we have, again, older forms, uh, older analogies for this in which missionaries arrive in China and they're borrowing Chinese buildings or converting Chinese buildings. And then from there, end up building buildings of their own. But this is also happening in 1925 in which passionist missionaries are going to a place and setting up congregations and churches. And they're doing the same things that previous missionaries did in terms of converting buildings and converting them in a way such that in these photographs, we see the crease marks are still fresh on the posters that they're using up in the right-hand side photo up on the upper balcony. Those are religious posters of St. Paul of the Cross that have been unfolded. And you can still see the crease marks on these posters that they're putting up all over this theater to convert the space into a space of Catholic liturgy, Catholic worship, Catholic imagination. We have the altar, we have the crucifix, we have kind of um, imitation stained glass there with images of the saints. And yet when we look as a whole at these images, we see that it's an amalgamation of a existing Chinese space that has been reappropriated and transformed and the other level here photographed with the camera that we just saw earlier, um, making the pic pictures of the outside now brought into the church. And something small I like to point out when we look at these images is that, I mean, you see the fuzziness. There's like the light images are kind of, there's a halo around them. Um, the edges of the frame have these white streaks on them. That's the environment. That's humidity and light leaks streaking onto the film. Um, and the missionaries write that mold is sprouting all over their books, their vestments, their cameras. And this is the humidity and the environment literally etching itself onto the images that we see. And we often look past that. Well, my God's a bad photographer. Maybe he loaded the film wrong. But really in part of this, this is actually the environment making a kind of subtle gesture that it itself is doing something with these images. So all these levels here and mapping onto, again, the kinds of existing or um, you know, what we would th think of as Chinese cultures with missionary decorations, with a kind of creation of this space in which uh, Chinese Catholicism is now being created physically and materially. In this case, um, a different uh, photograph from the Passionist collection, but an altar, which is in a way built on top of this Chinese style ornamental cabinet. And yet we have the white altar cloth, we have the tabernacle, we have the crucifix, we have St. Teresa. And then above that, another kind of unseen poster. And on the right-hand side, uh, barely visible, we have another catechetical um, catechism poster in which we uh, presumably have, you can barely see it, Chinese converts or um, believers kneeling at the foot of yet another altar. So there is this echoing of different images within the space of this photograph and the creation of, in this kind of micro form, a Chinese Catholic space that is simultaneously Chinese and simultaneously Catholic in the ornaments, in the materials, and the way that this type of space is portrayed. 
And again, one, I, I just want to kind of return us to that question of how would you make a picture of a religious building or religious community? You would think probably about how people would inhabit this space. You would think about how you would have a priest standing in front of this altar. You would have altar servers. How would you as a congregant uh, sit in relation to this altar? The photograph and this camera actually occupies a visual space closer to that of the priest. This is the proximity the priest would have had to that altar. So in a way, the photograph and the camera places us in the shoes of the people that would have inhabited this kind of space. So photograph as representation, but photograph also as embodiment of experience, embodiment of perception. And I'd like to kind of think about the ways that this maps onto the Protestant side. I'll be jumping back and forth between Protestant and Catholic images here, but compare that altar to this image made 1934 in a Presbyterian church in Hunan. And in this case, the primacy, the main focus of this image is not the symbols and the kinds of liturgical elements, it's words. It's the Protestant focus on sola scriptura, on belief framed by words. In this case, xing, wang, ai, faith, hope, and love. This tripartite um, representation here and these giants, I mean, just imagine being in a sanctuary and being confronted with these massive words staring down at you, faith, hope, and love. Underneath faith, you have the Apostles' Creed. Underneath love, you have the Ten Commandments. And underneath um, Wang, uh, you hope you have the Lord's Prayer. And these elements of Protestant faith that are literally represented, literally, in words occupying the space of this church, where in a Catholic setting, you would have the altar, you would have candles, you would have statues of the saints and Christ and Mary. This kind of photographic framing gives us another sense of embodiment, how one might sit and stand and sing and pray in this space, guided by the visual elements that would have occupied it. And again, there's a longer backstory. As you see, that's the original caption. There's a memorial service going on for a man who has died thousands of miles away in Oklahoma, a missionary who had once served this church as a medical doctor, and he's not there, but his photograph is. And in a way, his body is represented here by an image. And it's all these levels, which I will also not go into, but the body as a part of this community is something I want us to consider, that it is impossible to make a image or images of a religious community without the members of that community, that we must expand the category beyond simply the buildings. Of course, buildings are super important and they guide these images, but the buildings in, this, in these images become the frames by which these kinds of communities are represented. And it's the people it's the so-called inmates of the mission. And in this photograph, you, you see those pencil marks drawn around the frame to make the, the crop marks, to even make the image a little tighter. And the photographer has written on the back, these are not all the Christians. If you think you're seeing just the Christians that we have, think again. There are more Christians outside the frame of this camera than you see. These are just the people who are around the mission. But this gesture at what's in the frame and then what's outside the frame is a way of talking or showing, embodying this community that even a camera cannot capture. And in the case of the church you saw earlier with the light leaks and the flare, these are the altar boys, the acolytes, uh, the altar servers that would have inhabited that space, who would have walked through it, knelt, made the sign of the cross, carried incense, carried candles. These are my altar boys, as Doc, uh, Father Vance is writing here. And they are in that church, they are in that space. And we have to imagine that their bodies didn't just stand still for this photograph, they moved, they knelt, they did all these physical things, they gazed at the images, they gazed at the altar. And these are, in a way, the kinds of imaginations that are mapped onto these images, how these people would have participated in them. And really briefly, when I picked up this image in the, photo, in the archive and turned it over, the little boy, uh, second from the left, 
was written, those, his name was written on the back of the photo by Father Vance, and it was Ho, comma, Joseph. And I almost dropped the photo. I was like, oh my goodness, it's me. But uh, this is kind of like weird deja vu there, which again, I will just leave there. But um, archival discoveries, they're cool. Um, and in this other way, right, going back to the Protestants, what does it look like to embody a space? To have a self-supporting church with now the photographer is not at the center. The photographer is at the very end, the way the end of the church, the back, he's probably propped on a bench. He's holding a camera much like this one. He's looking down into it. He's trying not to disturb people. And this is a self-supporting church in which the photographer is trying to make himself as inconspicuous as possible. Foregrounding the embodiment, the people who are involved here. And these are the same members who in another picture just taken a couple minutes or perhaps later on that same day, who are new members of this church. And um, I'll flag here, it's really interesting. These, this church was set up by the young students of a certain architectural and engineering school. Uh, you know, the Beijing Gongchen, you can see it up there, right? There is a kind of engineering community that has also produced a religious community as part of their work. Um, and I can't, I can't add that, you know, kind of go there right now, but there's all these levels. And in this case, again, the words, again, this Protestant type of self-representation, holding the Bible, standing in front of the church placard. And in this case, we have a kind of cross forms, right? Um, on the wall here that is in words and yet forms the shape of a cross. And Mei Guo is much smaller than Ji Du Jiao, which is then on top of Zhang Ao Hui, right? So there's a kind of like, um, even in the size of the words matters and this display of belief, of belonging, of imagination and of modernity. Look at those fedoras, the guy with the bow tie and the round glasses. Tony Clark is modeling this right now. So we have this kind of, you know, modernity, Western influence, and yet you know, these words literally graven on these walls. And I'll shift here in a moment just to just talk about movement, because what we get in these photographs is a still frame. What about movies? What happens when we combine the technology of movies with these kinds of identities and questions? In this case, um, I can't show the movie because I'd clog up the internet and, and it'll be all choppy, like a GIF, you know, not so good. So I've given you still frames from one of these particular movies shot by an American Presbyterian medical missionary couple. And what happens when architecture appears in movies? There's movement. Uh, what you can tell here is that people are exiting the church. They're walking out from this building. They're going down the steps. They're also separated by gender. The men come out first, followed by the women and they're passing a tithes collection box in which one, of, one by one, they're putting in their offerings to support the church. And the building itself is immobile, but the inhabitants of the building are not. They move, they breathe, they go through this space and that film attempts to capture that. And it's just this long sequence of people coming out of this building almost comically. And you think, my goodness, there's a lot, a lot of people in that church. There's a lot of members of this community and it is meant to signal that people move through this space and that space belongs to them. So in a way, I also want us to um, map onto that kind of movement, the fact that sacred space may happen anywhere. Uh, I've added another frame there from the same movie in which there is a post-church meal that one of these women is now going to bless. She's gonna pray, she bows her head. And there's this cool moment when the camera operator actually shuts off the camera and prays and turns the camera back on because they participated in that prayer. And sacred space doesn't always happen within the confines of a physical building. It happens wherever two or three are gathered in my name, right? So there's a kind of physical and imagined sacred space in the courtyard of someone who's having a group that is having lunch after a church service. So this is of course from the Presbyterian tradition here. And I have traveled to that church, which is, you can kind of see it in the frames um, over there from 1934. They have substantially modified the building. They've actually turned the church um, 90 degrees in terms of its uh, orientation to expand the space. So now you, when you walk in, you see the rem rem remnants of what used to be the altar, but the, the bigger 
stage and the organ and the choir area is actually to the right of you. But that kind of physical coming down the steps into the gaze of the camera is meant to mirror how congregants would have done that physically. So seeing all of these kinds of experiences. Jumping ahead to another kind of film, and this is from the Jesuit side, a film that was made in 1946 to 1948 by a pair of California Jesuit filmmakers who are now in Yangzhou, fathers William Clement and Bernard Hubbard. And again, these are still images from that um, color film that they shot. And is interesting for this kind of film that there is motion and yet there is architecture and there is distance because that film was edited after the founding of the People's Republic of China. The film was shot before the founding and it was edited after these missionaries were no longer able to actually access this building. And you see in the screenplay, which is again, not on the screen, but the kind of voiceover that would have accompanied this film, the film opens with this shot and the narrator is saying, you know, as you come over the hill, you will see the Gothic spires of the Yangzhou church rising up over this city. And it's meant to echo the visualization of someone who cannot be there. But yet the film is making us do that. It's allowing us to see that kind of perspective as if we were there. But we know the filmmakers will not return. We know they will never see this church again in their lifetime because it's now been cut off by political and regime changes outside of their control. And it's interesting also to add that in this same film, in the screenplay for this film, William Clement writes, uh, you know, one day when Stalin and his red hordes will be on the dusty shelves of libraries, the church in China will still stand. So he's inferencing or, or referencing this kind of invisible church that will continue even if the architectural and visible elements of the church will disappear. And for that reason, the second film that, um, uh, in this case, Father Hubbard shot, and this of course is Shoshan, uh, Josha, um, we have these pilgrims coming up the hill to the basilica, and it is meant to, the film is meant for you to look at their bodies and to imagine that the Catholic Church in China will persist beyond the moment that this film was shot. That is not based simply in a building. That sacred space is created by the people who move through a space, who clutch the, their, their scriptures, who pray, who kneel, who make the sign of the cross, who stop at the stations of the cross. And ultimately that film ends with this long shot, this kind of um, close up of the Christ child being held aloft. And the narration provided by Father Hubbard says, you know, this is the kind of over these great plains of China that the infant Christ is held aloft. So there's this movement back and forth between community as imagined and visualized in physical form as people, and community that is visualized in architectural form that, you know, long after all these political developments go away, that this church will still stand, whether that is in physical form or whether that is in communal, imagined, and believed form. Yet there's another echoing there here too with the Protestants, uh, in this case, the Henke family who made the earlier film uh, of the church in Shunda. After the war, they return to China and they load their camera with a new media, Kodachrome, and they make color footage of the Easter sunrise service at the Circular Mound Altar in 1948. And we know, well, they don't know, but we know that soon China is going to go through massive changes. In fact, China is already going through massive changes politically, socially, uh, economically at the time that this film is made. And yet it is an attempt to gesture at the timelessness or the kind of physical space inhabited in this place, in this case by Protestants, that is connected to a longer imagination, a longer time, a kind of infinity that will exist before, during, and beyond the moment that this film is made. And I can't quite tell there, uh, Dr. O'Keefe may be able to add it, but I interpret the uh, Chinese minister standing up there as Wang Mingdao. Uh, uh, perhaps one of these major figures here, but um, the, the idea here more is that the film is in different segments and the, the, the filmmaker actually goes to make a close up, he steps back or she steps back and you see the entire 
alter, and then they go back to visualize or show all these people after the service walking out through the gates, leaving the altar, but taking their faith with them to other parts of the city, to other time periods, to other places. And I like to kind of map, bring this back to Gresnik, because in a way, I, I, we see here that he himself is thinking about some of these ideas. He writes about the altar in the temple of heaven as constituting this kind of impressive symbol that is also um, a non-symbol. It's a platform. It's an empty canvas. It's a space in which you may map onto this emptiness, the openness to the sky, the openness to Tian or heaven, your belief, worship of the one and only being. And um, he's referencing Laozi here in the Dao Zi Jing. Um, but he says, he concludes that this is the extreme limit of grandeur to which human reason, unaided by revelation, can attain in its endeavor to penetrate the mystery that lies beyond the flaming ramparts of the universe. This kind of infinity that the frame itself is bigger than the platform. The frame itself is the universe. And that gesture here by the Protestants of Easter sunrise is in a way echoed in this idea that we are here to worship something greater than physically we can preserve or physically we can represent. And uh, Dr. Easton Law yesterday brought up um, you know, James Legg and he himself, Legg, visited the altar uh, when he first arrived in China and was so moved by the emptiness that he took off his shoes and sang the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Gresnik himself, I think, goes through some kind of evolution in his thought in the few years he was in China. Because in 1928, he writes about grandeur, he writes about limitless, he, uh, -ness. he writes about this openness. And by 1931, he's also ending with this question, where is China going? How can we uh, participate in this kind of shift when, at the same time, no eclectic combination or of old and new or of East or West will of itself solve the problem of China's rebirth? So he kind of goes back and forth between these tensions about how to see, how to imagine, and how, wh what place does the architect um, stand in this massive project of providing China a kind of rebirth. Because uh, in a way, the frame is too large. The frame is too big. No, cap no camera can possibly capture it. No image can possibly frame it. No one community or one perspective can possibly capture the kind of renewal of a more radical kind that is, as he says, now a necessity for China. And he goes on to quote Hu Shi uh, and all of these other, and in a way, what he's saying here is also the, the kinds of perspectives that were there at the end of the imperial era. You know, Zheng Guofan, Li Hongzhang, the kinds of where, where, where can we take good from the West and reject the bad? Where can we take good from the ancient kinds of traditions and give something new? And I'm going off a different tangent here, but all of this is far beyond the camera. And yet it's about perspective. It's about imagination and how one might map these images and these thoughts onto what's visible. And as we keep these final thoughts in mind, they echo, of course, what we see today in North China, Hebei, a Gothic cathedral surrounded by elements that would not have been there at all when it was built, cars, convenience stores. Xi Jinping, he's right there in the uh, left corner there waving at you. Uh, and all of these levels and layers that are built onto how we see, and I'll say here, this is a photograph taken by drone, that the technology itself is now allowing us to see a different perspective, and yet these layers of how we might imagine where that perspective began and where it is going. And the final thought I'll leave you with here as we uh, wrap up here, and I, I don't know if I'm going early or late, but hopefully there's enough time. Um, and yes, Father Rob, I had to include you, that we ourselves are contending with, thinking about in this present moment, how visual technology is simultaneously bridging us and yet separating us. It is also combining and reifying and making visible um, the kinds of practices, beliefs, fears, anxieties that we have about this present moment, that we have virtual mass, we have virtual homilies, we have virtual singing, we have virtual Eucharist, 
um, and other kinds of liturgical and communal aspects. And yet, literally right now, all of us are not together. We're in different places. And it is through the frame, through the screen, through the camera, that we are doing all of these communal things and thinking about what is beyond and how we might one day, I hope one day, be back together again in physical form. So belief, imagination, and image are all wrapped up in these ideas. And I hope that as we think about sacred space and the role of the camera in, in framing these kinds of spaces and ideas, that we are also, in a way, thinking about how we contend with the camera illuminata, the illuminated chambers of our own place and our own time. Thank you. Professor Ho, thank you so much. Um, let's just turn it over very quickly to Professor Amy O'Keefe, who will be providing uh, her response. Thank you so much, Dr. Ho, for that talk. Um, as a, an individual and as a historian, I tend to think of photographs as a means to preserve, to remember, to hold on to. I'm thinking right now of my children and how I feel that I haven't taken enough photographs of them. Um, how every now and then I look back at an old one and uh, you know, wish I could grab those chubby little cheeks or uh, you know, hold that child on my lap again. Dr. Ho's talk has modeled a historian's approach to photographs as objects that preserve, as he has done what, um, what all good historians try to do, but has done it better than most of us can. Um, Dr. Ho has analyzed every detail of these photographs, including drawing out things like um, the way that moisture was clearly present in the air and how that's been preserved for us to see in this little record. The urge to preserve the past of the Chinese architecture is one that's already been noted as part of uh, Gresnik's approach. And I'm just gonna apologize right now because if I tried to pronounce it better, I would just pronounce it even worse. So, uh, sorry. Um, and I believe that Gresnik's urge to preserve the best parts of Chinese architecture stem from a deep respect and admiration that he had for that architecture and for what it could do to people who were there, who could observe it, um, who could take part in its interaction with the environment around it, um, and who could feel the feelings that it was meant to inspire. I think his admiration for that work and for the philosophies that that architectural work reflected uh, is really well communicated in the two articles that we have read in preparation for the symposium. This admiration and desire to preserve is part of a phenomenon that I know as fulfillment theology. It's a mechanism that I've studied most in the Protestant context. Um, and it's based on this scripture, Matthew 5, 17, in which Jesus said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. This idea of fulfillment theology was used by sympathetic missionaries and some Chinese Christians alike um, to urge for the preservation of aspects of Chinese culture and their inclusion in Chinese Christianity. The law and the prophets are seen as part of a past Hebrew, uh, a sacred Hebrew past, right? The, the precursor to Christianity, um, a, a promise that Christ fulfilled, a promise that maybe couldn't be fully understood until Christ fulfilled it. And I think that we can see Gresnik finding similar promises in Chinese architecture. Um, he says, I'm looking at his 1931 article in case anybody else has their copy highlighted and pulled out in front of them. On, on the second to last page of that article, he talks about China's changes in the modern era. And he says, 
Renewal of a more radical kind than her past has ever known is now a necessity for China. Henceforth, her main problem will be to discard nothing that is good in her ancient culture and to accept nothing that is bad in the scientific industrialism of a modern West. A little later, he says, it is obvious nonetheless that the fulfillment of any promise the future may hold forth depends to a large extent upon the wisdom with which the past is salvaged and the new is tried. Um, I think that the, the desire to see a parallel between um, the, the promises of Hebrew scripture and the promises of Chinese architecture or other aspects of um, ancient Chinese religion and philosophy is um, one that springs from sincere admiration um, and that springs from perhaps uh, a life that's been changed by that Chinese culture, by that art. And so it's, it's lovely. I think it's in many ways a very lovely impulse. It allows for a generous reading of the culture in question, in this case, of course, Chinese culture. Um, and it's an alternative to a rejection of Chinese culture as heathen or, you know, satanic, right? Which we don't see a lot of, but I, I know has been, those attitudes have been a part of the missionary enterprise at some, in some times and places and people. Um, so I've, I've thought quite a lot about this fulfillment theology idea. And I think that, um, I, I think that Gresnik does it well, right? We can see in this photograph, this image of, um, um, of the university sort of built as a citadel. Uh, that's the word that um, Kumin's used, right? Uh, this, this beautiful citadel based on the drum towers and the city walls. Um, and we can see a fulfillment of those promises, right? So much strength, uh, so much protection perhaps, uh, so much permanence in this, in this hope for institution. Um, so this is really lovely. But I think also that um, some of the points that were made earlier today have struck me as I've thought about this. Um, Professor Wong and Professor Ireland talked about um, Gresnik's approach and I think it's important that we remember that Gresnik did indeed um, essentialize Chinese architecture in a narrow way. Right, the, the, if I can make a, a hacky analogy, the photograph that he looked at was a, was a, a tightly framed photograph, right? He wasn't looking um, it, at some of the more day-to-day -day examples of, of Chinese architecture um, and instead was looking for particularly sort of um, uh, monolithic and, and grandiose examples. And yet in them, he did find some really beautiful um, symbols of reverence for nature and, and brought those out for us. I think that in Gresnik's desire to preserve um, the past of Chinese architecture in Christianity, we see a limitation of imagination. Um, we see him, uh, I see in Gresnik a, a parallel to myself viewing photographs as, um, as a means to preserve. But I think that what Dr. Ho has done for us in this talk is to use photographs as a means to invite. Um, Dr. Ho has invited us to become photographers ourselves, has invited us under the hood um, and into the view of the camera. Um, he's invited us to consider how we would preserve uh, a current image for the future. Um, and in doing this, he's also invited us to look at communities of Christians uh, in, and, and to see communities of Christians beyond the frame of the photograph. And I think this is very powerful. Um, I think also that many of the photographs that Dr. Ho has shared with us, um, including this one, are themselves invitations. Um, and I particularly loved, in light of what Gresnik wrote, I love this sort of casual question, how do you like the mountains? I think that question alone, Gresnik would see as a success of this architecture, right? If you come into this 
um, this situation and you are struck by the power of the mountains, then perhaps there is something beautifully Chinese um, about uh, the, the situation of this architectural accomplishment. Um, so I wanna thank Dr. Ho for his invitation and for passing along to us the invitations of photographers to join communities of Christians in the past and to remember that the promises that those communities and that those images hold were never promises that could be completely uh, predicted. The church that Dr. Ho went into um, from a different angle than the angle of the people who came out of it, you know, in, in your video, I'm stumbling over that, but hopefully everybody, you know, got that powerful image. Um, you know, that church changed over time. And uh, that is because it is a living church. Um, so these, these photographs um, and these buildings are our frames and our doorways and our entryways that invite us into experiences, into perspectives, um, and invite us to remember things that are beyond what we can see and what we can experience in those perspectives. So thank you, Dr. Ho. Professor O'Keefe, thank you so much. I, I found myself so far taking an almost equal amount of notes, furiously taking notes uh, with respondents as I do with the presenters. So thank you for those remarks. Just very quickly, uh, P Professor Ho, I'll, I'll have you respond to P Professor O'Keefe's remarks, but I, I just have to note briefly, this is a little tangential footnote, that, that it beings that there was a Joseph Ho as an altar boy at the Passionist Mission, I'm somehow thinking that the Ho family may have some, you may have ancestry uh, that were somehow connection to the Passionist Mission, which makes you more sort of a, a closer type of friendship with Father Carboneau as a Passionist priest. So I'll let you uh, respond first. Then there are two questions, uh, and then I'll open it up to the floor. We have absolutely wonderful amount of time right now. So I'll, I'll have you uh, respond first. Thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. O'Keefe, I think your comments in terms of you know, expanding the view and also thinking about how this kind of theology of fulfillment maps onto these images is very useful. I haven't really, I hadn't really considered that. So thank you so much for, for really beautifully articulating um, how these kinds of uh, first belief and vision and perspectives combine or, or they map onto each other. Um, in terms of the, and I thank you for the kind of, uh, the very kind words as about the, you know, what I'm doing with these images here and echo echoing that out. I do believe that, you know, every photograph is an invitation. Um, every photograph is an invitation to interpret, to imagine, to think what's, you know, about what's in the frame and what's beyond the frame. And at the same time, uh, and you mentioned, you opened your remarks with this comment about your children and how time has changed and the children have changed and these images don't change. Um, there's this powerful moment in Camera Lucida by the French philosopher and semiotician Roland Barthes, who writes about every photograph being a has been. And when he thinks, he looks at this image and sees himself being held by his mother as a small child, and he thinks about how, well, I, I don't remember that instant. I don't remember what I saw as a child, but I know I was there. And I know I was held by my mother at that moment in time. So in this way, I think that maps very well onto how these images themselves have this kind of captured reality. It's a framed reality. And it's also a captured time that exists within a longer spectrum of time, such that we, you know, we have this, uh, we're saturated with images and we often think about the before and after. Here's that Gothic church in 1905. And there's that Gothic church surrounded by, uh, you know, uh, Kanduji and all these other, you know, uh, uh, present 21st century cars and, and other kinds of environments. Um, and those images mark time and yet reference a longer time that exists beyond them. So um, I'm just thankful, grateful for what you provided today. And I look forward to other comments and questions as we go along. Thank you. Let me let me just uh, ask two questions and then open it up. Um, happily, we have a good amount of time now. So the first question is thinking about, let me read this more slowly, thinking about how we think about Chinese Christian architecture, we must bear in mind that we digest what we see through the mediums we employ to study it. So the quotation here is by McLuhan, the medium is the message. So the question then is, how have you, 
changed your ideas about these spaces uh, when you have encountered the spaces yourself as a scholar in person after having maybe first digested them through the medium of the photograph? It's a great question. Um, I think that's where my idea about embodiment comes. Um, and also thinking about you know, the, you know, how one inhabits a space. Because it's one thing to see an image and think about and imagine what's there. It's another thing to walk through the space in which that image was made and then reinterpret it in the frame of uh, what you've encountered in that image. Um, I, I jokingly tell people that I, I studied so many images of you know, pre-war Beijing uh, before finally going to China for the first time that I have expected to see camels just half expected to see camels. And yet I, was, I did not see any camels. Uh, and this kind of idea that the image has this resonance that maps then onto what you see in, in the real world. Um, so I think part of it is when you walk through a church and you, you think about, or you even witness, or you participate in services or, or uh, religious activities there, it adds something to that space that is beyond and runs a thread through the image that you've worked with uh, prior. So um, I think this is, in a way, a kind of case to be made for scholars to do field work, to inhabit and go through and see and touch and feel uh, the kinds of uh, communities and spaces and architectures that we work with, as well as a reminder that these images are almost like they're fragments. They're fragments of the past that have a future. So this the second question is is uh, it's, it's it's my own. So this is my inaugural question of my own. Uh, and, and interestingly, when I first lived in Beijing in the 1990s for the first time, I lived in a Liang Zicheng designed building, and that made me sort of in, inspired in me at least an admiration for uh, Liang Zicheng, an admiration for his round glasses, which I think maybe stuck. Um, but but also yesterday, Professor Kumans. And I received an image from Professor Steinhardt of a kind of uh, aesthetic flourish that was placed on a Muslim mosque. And um, I, I spent a great deal of time looking at this image. And I know we, we, the three of us uh, were sort of sharing some thoughts about that. But so it inspires this question. Academic studies of religious architecture in China have largely analyzed physical space almost exclusively physical space. We've learned a lot from those sort of academic books. But you know, my question then is, can you say more about how scholars, this is really a question about craft. Can you say more about how scholars can use missionary photographs, how we can use these to help us better understand the human sociological domain of these spaces? So if we were a scholar, how do we use these photographs? You've said some things about this, but can you reflect a little bit more? How can we use these as scholars uh, in a way to uh, think about the sociological do domain of these, these spaces with, with a bit more richness? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. I see it as finding ways to read the image and finding ways to read the image that allow us to access or add another dimension to the kinds of uh, actions and materiality and imagination that would have been embedded in the community or the, or the place or the people um, that the image covers. And, and I, that's a kind of an open-ended response, but I think it's a way of using the image, not simply as an illustration of something, but as an artifact that existed within that space, within that place, and that is connected to other kinds of imagination. Um, and I'm happy to chat more about how I particularly, I mean, this differs from person to person. And I can't say like my, this is one way to do it. And that's exactly how you should do it. But I think it's a way of moving beyond using images simply to as kind of one dimensional, um, here is a church. And let me write about that church in great detail, but that's just an image that represents a flat vision of that church. There is so much more in there. I mean, as, as uh, we've talked about today, and as you've seen throughout the symposium, there are all these layers. And perhaps as we look at these images, we can excavate some of those layers, whether it is the clothing, whether it's the expression, whether it is the technology that plays some kind of role in making that community visible, or even what's not visible. Ask the question of what's not there. Why is the image not showing this? Why is the missionary or the Chinese Christian not making other kinds of images. So I think from there, the semicolon appears 
and then we have the questions that flow from it. I, I'm really, uh, I'm very intrigued by Professor Kuman's remark, and, 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 and it's not exactly a question, but I'm going to read that remark. It's about the intentionality behind the framing of a photograph before it's produced, right? And I, I just want to read his remark and have you uh, reflect on this, because I think it's a very significant point. Please don't forget the role of photos in East-West propaganda for fundraising raising vocations and so forth. The Shanghai Jesuits had their professional photographers working for Tushan Wan Press organizing photo ops. So can you reflect upon that domain of photography? Yeah, it's excellent comment, excellent question. I always get that question whenever I give presentations because it's a good one. It's really good. And I think part of it, um, I, I have to say, is that one of our immediate reactions to seeing missionary images is to assign a lot to the missionary, to say that this is an image that is produced to do X, Y, and Z. And that's true. I mean, of course, images are used for fundraising. They're used to raise awareness. They're used to, um, as a kind of channel or conduit through which support may be gained for the mission. That's absolutely true. And it's something that is worth exploring. I think what I try to expand beyond is to think about how that's not the only mode by which images exist, operate. It's not the only kind of imagination. However, it is true, images have a kind of financial and material impact on people's imagination. It is meant to arouse some kind of sympathy, some kind of interest that will then somehow be translated in yet another form into support for the mission, whether that is spiritual support, financial support, um, but I think what, I, what we just have to remember is that that also assumes a one direction, a unidirectionality of images, that they're made by a missionary, they're sent somewhere, and money comes back. That happens, but that is the, not the only mode by which images exist. And I think we have to also then fight the impulse to say that if that's the only case, then images are only propaganda. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying that to any, you know, this is an excellent question. I feel like uh, we have much more to, to, to add to that, but it is much more, I think, than, um, you know, it includes propaganda, it includes support, but it also includes everything else that we've covered today. Excellent. I'd like to pull in Professor Kumans, who actually published an article of the Tushan, with, uh, an article with a photograph, Professor Kumans, you know this photograph. It's in the Tushan one, um, at Lie, I guess, and in the background you see little statues of churches, architectural churches. It's a marvelous photograph. But please, Professor Kumans, I'd love to hear more about your ideas here. Yeah, um, I'm fascinating about photography, so I was also fascinating by your your um, your talk, uh, Mr. Ho. Thank you, thank you very much. And indeed, I. I completely agree with your idea of these multi levels in pictures because. In fact, each generation is looking to pictures with different eyes. You are looking to the pictures of your parents uh, and you see things on these pictures that they never would have noticed because we belong to another time. We are looking with other lenses and we are today producing photographies tremendously. Every day we produce hundreds of pictures, including selfies. So our relation to the picture is completely different. So uh, including color and all these things. But mission um, used photography from as soon as it was possible, including the first missionary journals who could not technically print photographies. They had drawers and engravers who were trans transferring photographies into engravings. And then they were published in Le Mission Catholique, for example, from the 1860s and 1870s. And they mentioned in the caption, engraving made after a photography. And I have found often the original and the engraving, and it is amazing to see the quality of the engraving made upside down in, in order to be published uh, right. So it is, it is fascinating. But when you see further the propaganda using photographies, for example, all the mission of the Saint Enfance, the Holy Childhood, all these pictures of orphan babies, that were really, the pictures were produced to really beg money in, 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 in Europe. 
this should be a topping on itself. There were postcards with these babies that could be sent to children in order to raise money. I'm finishing a book on Sir Shan. It's now under translation. Sir Shan has been, I think, the site the most photographed, even more than Beitang in China, because of the promotion of a pilgrimage, which is a big strategy of the Jesuits. That's the idea of the book. Yeah? They throw away a temple of Guanyin, they replace Guanyin by the Virgin Mary, and they photograph all the steps of this taking of possession of a holy mountain at the local, a regional, a national level, and then at the international level with the coronation of the Virgin. I think I can, you can see this. This is yeah. a picture where you see the movie maker. You see he's holding his camera. And what is he doing? A photo op of the, the cardinal crowning the, the statue of the Virgin Mary, the coronation, uh, approved by the Pope. So we are here in a worldwide network. And this pilgrimage has been, there is a, a movie about it. I found some traces, but I never seen the movie. So I'm very glad that you found it, or I think it's, it's, it's that one. But here you really have a, a, an example of propaganda. But of course, that movie is telling so much more because, um, well, you have all the groups contributing to the pilgrimage. You see the musicians, you see all the things happening. And uh, it is just a new technology for spreading images in the context of the power of images. And these movies was used in the actualities in cinemas in Europe, in the United States, uh, to show what was, what was happening there. And the last point, if I may, is I think that one of the oldest of the first Chinese photographers was a Jesuit. So it is brother E, e U. His mother was a Chinese, his father was a, a British. And he uh, became one of the brothers working in Tushanwan. And he was the first in charge of the photography atelier workshop. So he had the professional material. And uh, he was making these photographies. And these photographies were converted with a photo mechanical system in order to be printed. So this was the modern technology. I think Tushan Wan is the first place in China where these technology were, were uh, used. And they were massively used in the publication of Tushan Wan. But you know, Jesuits don't like the brothers, I mean, as much as the fathers. So uh, making historical research on brother Jesuits is considerably difficult. So that makes my work difficult because most architects were brothers, uh, carpenters and these guys. So, but I found one picture made by, by Brother E, and at the back, there is a mention of what camera he has taken. And it's a picture of orphans, and they are all laughing. They are all happy. They are not, you know, uh, unhappy as usual on pictures because they have been sermonated not to move. Huh? Here, they are all laughing. They are on the side of the hill of Shoshan, and at the back, it's mentioned the kind of camera he used and who took the picture. This is absolutely fitting in your story because you are looking through the eyes of the photographer how Chinese are smiling. And Dr. Cummins, it's a really good comment you might make really, really quickly respond here. Um, I think there, there are certainly different genres involved. And I think that's something that uh, we should all keep in mind that there are, are the, there's the official genre. What is printed in Mission Catholic, right? What is printed in the sign magazine? Um, there's also vernacular genres of missionaries who are simply there making images. And the question of what happens when you have an image without an audience? It, what happens when you make images simply to process the environment in which you're in? And that of course differs from posing orphans with objects and printing the image and engraving it and sending it off for support. So I think all these levels are certainly there and they're not mutually exclusive, but they do inhabit the same spaces sometimes at the same times. So I love your comments here and I love to see that photo and I wanna know what camera that is because probably I'm gonna to try to find it and reconstruct it like, like that one uh, in the back. But uh, certainly these are all really good um, comments that you've brought up here, Dr. Kumans. Thank you.
maybe an additional thing, there are also photos of photographers. You see missionaries with their cameras. You see the missionary taking a picture of the Chinese boy who is wearing all his material, all his glass plates. Uh, you have the famous Italian uh, Pime uh, photographer, Father Leoni. Nani. This is a very famous one, a very good photographer, and there are self-portraits also. So there is a lot of to do on this field. So, Excellent. Well, first, before we go to the next question by Professor or by Father Carboneau, which is is this 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 what just happened is a great segue because I think the Professor Kumans just turned me into a post structuralist. He uh, he showed us a digitized print image through the medium of his cell phone through the medium of Zoom, uh, and that was quite exciting. But uh, Father Carboneau asked the question: If you could reflect upon the relationship between past print images and digital images today? Uh, it's, Father Rob, that's a, that's a really big question. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> I think part of this is the question of what is born digital versus what was a product of a, a photomechanical process. Um, in both cases, right, we have light falling on some kind of media that then is converted into an image. Um, but when we have a photomechanical process, right, we have the film, <laughs> We have the enlargement or the print. We have all these chemical steps that are involved that is physical. But with a born digital image, the question of course is, you know, I guess it goes back to uh, Dr. David Wong's question about the cyber type of input. That image is falling on a sensor which then can be manipulated in whatever way um, you would like outside of the confines of a photomechanical process with its own kind of re retouching and cropping. Um, and to bring it back to the examples that we've used today, um, I, I have found, and I'm sure you've seen, uh, signed photographs, uh, passionist photographs, in which they've painted out the background, or they've taken the kind of grease pencil to try to el eliminate the outlines to make people clearer and to remove that horse that is staring at you in the back, or, or that tree that has something on it that you don't want to see. Um, so I think part of it is the, the materiality changes. The relationship to the object of the camera and the, the objects that go with it, the film, the processing, the developing, the sending, the engraving, as Dr. Kumans has talked about, that shifts when it becomes a direct born digital type of um, encounter. And in this case, right now, we are all looking at born digital images. All of you right now are, are a born digital image that is now mediated not by the film or the enlarger, but by your laptop or your phone or your computer. So that relationship shifts. So we have three minutes remaining. Uh, I'd like to just open it up. It, it's it's a, it's a exciting and, and uh, challenging to try and fit in all the questions, but I'd like to open it up, especially sort of give preference to the respondents or participants if anyone has a question for Professor Ho. Just unmute and... There seems to be, I think we are all illuminated already. Uh, Professor Ho, we just have a couple more minutes. Is there any sort of final remarks you'd like to provide? Oh, and we also, I should also mention that in the chat, um, there is a link to something about Professor Kuman's book on Shushan, which I'm very excited about. But by the way, you might know this, Professor Kuman's, there's a beautiful Buddhist pagoda as you walk up to the pilgrimage site, which I think I photographed at least as much as the Shushan site when I was there. And then uh, Professor Wong also reminds us that Henrietta Harrison has written an article on the holy childhood uh, and with, with herself, with an interesting engraving also. But Professor Ho, do you have a final remark you'd like to provide in the last minute? Sure. Uh, so I think the last thing for us to all consider and take away uh, is to perhaps question and think about the role of the image, the um, maker, the subject and the audience in these kinds of histories? Where does the image combine the kinds of experiences of the maker, the photographer, or the developer, um, the subject, the person in front of the lens, and the audience, the person behind the lens or to which the image is going? So I feel like there's so much, all, all, so much there, and I certainly appreciate all your comments and questions, but these are multi-layered images with multi-layered experiences. Thank you.
Well, everyone, uh, we will now take a 15 minute break and return at the top of the hour for our last official presenter with the respondent. Uh, Father Rob Carboneau will be speaking at my 11 a.m. So uh, let's take a 15 minute break and we will reconvene then and he will talk about, uh, he will bring us into the present, which will be quite, quite exciting. So thank you everyone and I'll see you shortly. <laughs>